I became just more aware of what are my beliefs? What are my values? What do I think is important? Because it seemed like everyone in my world was choosing a different path than what we were on. And everything had just not only broken, but just dispersed. And it was like ashes blowing away in the wind. We weren't close anymore. My sister started doing her thing. My brother started doing his thing. Um, My mom, I didn't see her very much. So at that point in my life, I almost didn't have a parent of any kind. Tracy makes some really excellent points, actually. She talks about beliefs. She talks about values. And these are all really super important things when we run our own businesses. And there is a theme, actually, through the interview when you listen to Tracy's story and that her childhood and the effect of her parents, um, what her parents had on her, has been really quite significant. Um, You'll hear about her father and what he did for work and how that influenced her and how that probably shaped her values and beliefs and what she was capable of doing. And even, you know, a setback that she experienced in her family, she managed to overcome that and make the best of it. A super interesting story. As you probably know by now, they all are just amazing. And just to say that Tracy is a a supplier to me. She's a voiceover that I've used in a project for some of my US clients. And she's just been an amazing supplier, truly grateful for the work and the quality and the professionalism of what she does. So if you if you do need voiceovers, I highly recommend you check her out as well. And all the details are, of course, as always, in the show notes, uh, in the blog post at the end of the podcast as well. So enjoy Tracy's story. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Tracy. How are you today? I am so great and so excited to be here. Thank you. I, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast as well because there's a couple of things, um, and I'll mention right up front that you're a, a voice actor, voiceover, as we call them in the in the UK. And um, the one thing that's so great about having you on, I don't have to coach you about the technology. <laughs> Or anything like that, because I know you'll have that sorted without any problems. So that's that's what I do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I appreciate your time. Um, you're obviously in the USA. I'm in the UK. And the reason that you're on the podcast is because I've used you for one of my projects, which I'm really super delighted about the work that you did there. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But to get things going, I ask all my guests the same question, which is tell us a little bit about your personal life. And that means where you were born, a bit about your education, have you moved around, where you now live. So people get a sense of where you've come from. And then as we get into the education, we can talk about work and go from there. So over to you, Tracy. Okay. well, thanks again, Michael. Um, For those who I mean, nobody knows this story except you and I. But um, Mm -hmm. when we worked together, you know, I knew that you had a podcast and you'd mentioned it to me probably about a year ago. And then I'd forgotten and hadn't listened. And I wish that I had, because when I started to catch up, I realized how much value you've got in this podcast. And I also didn't realize that it's so unique in the fact that you really delve into someone's personal life. But you can learn so much from that. Um, And so as I was going along, I found definitely some themes that people talked about. They talked about adversity. Um, One person, I remember it was Nick. He talked about his sandwich business and how it failed after a year Mm. because they didn't charge enough for their product. And that really resonated with me because of how I price my voiceover. And um, I remember Adrian said something about being a lifelong learner and staying curious that I really enjoyed, too. Mm. So. I have gained so much from your podcast, and I just want to thank you for that. And um, and the cheekiness of me even asking to be on it, (laughs) um, I appreciate you saying yes. You didn't have to do that. I've never actually asked one of my clients if I could please come onto their podcast. 
So oh, well, you'd be the first. Oh, well, I'm delighted you did, actually. And I, I wish more people did actually ask. So anybody listening, if you want to be on my podcast, just let me know. Because <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, uh, now, I'm, I'm selective who I say yes to, of course. Um, but as long as people have, you know, they're self-employed, and they have less than 10 employees in their organization, I want to hear from them because I'm I'm really targeting that kind of micro business and they generally are single person businesses, generally. Uh, but I've had a few that went over the 10 employees. I forgave them in the end <laughs> because actually their story was still super useful. But 99.9%, but .9 they're kind of small, small, small micro companies. Um, so yeah, I'm. I was delighted that you asked. Definitely. Well, thank you. And I fit into that category. I'm. A, I'm a one person business. And so to get back to your question, Perfect. I was born in St. Joseph, Missouri, which is right in the absolute middle of the United States and in the mm. heart of the Midwest, what people consider the Midwest, and just ag agricultural area. There's cows and corn and soybeans everywhere around here. Um, people are more spread out. There's a lot more land to be had because um, the culture is not so vibrant as on the coasts. Right. Um, people move a little slower here. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot more, like I said, an agricultural focus. So yeah. I did not grow up in a farming family, but I grew up in sort of a working class family. Um, I'm still here, actually. A lot of your guests have moved around and I've traveled, but I've, been, I've never actually moved anywhere. Wow. So that's something that's unique. I know I've lived here and I'm 36 now. So I've lived here my entire life. I've tried to move. Honestly, I did. <laughs> um, but I'll get to that. But it's Sometimes, unusual for, uh, let's call it generic Americans, for Americans not to move around much because most of them that I've met, they've moved all over the shop, <laughs> all over America. <laughs> Yeah. Um, for me, it just didn't happen that way. Um, but I'll get into that. Okay. So I'm still here in my hometown of St. Joseph, Missouri, and it's it's about an hour away from Kansas City, which is um, one of the biggest cities in Missouri, but still not that big compared to a lot of other places. Mm. Um, but that's the nearest big city. And, you know, we go there for, for fun and for date nights and stuff like that. But um, I'm mostly here and I work from my home. I'm in my home studio right now talking to you. Mm. And that is delightful. Um, a little bit. So I grew up in a family where my dad actually sold firearms for a living and knives, which is wow. such an odd career. <laughs> I know, especially for the UK. Yes. Um, that is not that is not something that you hear about much. But this was also, you know, the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And it was more acceptable then. And he quit doing that um, as laws became stricter and things like that. But he did sell guns for 17 years. And I remember being a seven-year-old child and carrying rifles wow. in a box. It's in a box. It's sealed yeah. and it's not loaded. But my parents worked me hard. I remember trimming the hedge on Saturday and it would take all day. You know, you dreaded hedge day on Saturday because <laughs> it was hot. It was poison ivy. It was sweat and dirt and rash. But we all got out there together. And I have um, I'm the middle child. Uh, I have an older sister and a younger brother. Right. Um, and then my my mom and dad. So just, you know, things like that. Just I remember having a chore list. I always had to work hard. Mm. Um, we didn't we didn't have animals or anything. But I mean, we had to scrub the toilets, mop the floors. I just always remember working hard. And that was just what we did. Yeah. It was never you know, thought of any different and everybody pitched in. Mm. Um, I was I went to public school for a couple of years and then switched to private school. Um, I did that for I think it was just actually one year. And then my mom decided to homeschool us. Mm. So I was homeschooled from fourth grade through the end of my freshman year of high school, which would be grade nine. And then my parents got a divorce, and I, I, I recognized that that was kind of a theme in some of the stories I was hearing as well. And I think when we face adversity like that, especially at a younger age, uh, it just really forces us to grow up a little bit quicker and to make decisions for ourselves 
a little bit more decisively. Yeah. And at that point, um, that's when I really grew in my faith as a Christian. It's when I became just more aware of what are my beliefs? What are my values? What do I think is important? Because it seemed like everyone in my world was choosing a different path than what we were on. And everything Mm -hmm. had just not only broken, but just dispersed. And it was like ashes blowing away in the wind. We weren't close anymore. My sister started doing her thing. My brother started doing his thing. Um, My mom, I didn't see her very much. So at that point in my life, I almost didn't have a parent of any kind. Mm. Um, it was it was a sad situation, but I grew a lot from it. And my dad and I are very close now today. Unfortunately, my mom and I are not. Uh, but but that's not my choice. Um, <clears throat> I think divorce it really hurts people uh, in several situations. But like I said, it forced me to grow up. And um, at that point, I just started working a lot. Even when I was a kid, I would be the kid that would, you know, knock, knock, knock. And, hey, can I sell you some cookies? Can I rake your yard? Can I uh-huh. take, can I shovel your snow? I was always looking for ways to earn money. I babysat from the age of 12 and I love children. And that actually plays pretty um, largely into my story about my love of children. And I actually have four kids now. They're nine, seven, five, and three. Wow. Um, but... I'm getting ahead of myself, but so I've always loved kids. I've always worked hard and had jobs. My husband laughed at me Um, when we started dating. He was helping me with my taxes and I had probably five jobs one year just to make ends meet in college Mm. because I had to pay for it myself. Um, You know, I guess I'm kind of jumping back and forth in the story. I apologize. It's okay. (laughs) That's fine. That's the way it goes. It's no problem at all. So, um, you know, here I am just kind of doing my own thing and making my own choices. I could have made some really, really stupid decisions, but I feel like God protected me because I didn't. I didn't make a lot of bad decisions. I started going to church more and there were several women that sort of took me under their wing and became a mother figure to me. Right. And I'm, I'm still very, very close to many of those women and and still attend the same church. So um, that helped me to gain that confidence that we need. mm, Absolutely. And, how much do you think the the fact that your dad was in business and regardless of the merchandise he was selling, there was a business environment there, and then coupled with that, the the fact that, you know, you had a lot of chores and a lot of work that you had to do as a young person, a young child, um, for your parents and support them as well and do your bit in the family, how much that that whole, how much do you think that would have influenced you through your life? See, this is why you're such a good interviewer, Michael, because that does play a huge part. Because mm. um, I did watch my dad. My dad was self-employed and he made really good money. Um, mm. I mean, he had an airplane. He built a garage. I mean, he did like all this stuff. And I really didn't think about money then because I didn't understand it. Mm. But um, he did very, very well for himself. And I I watched him work hard. I, wa- I worked alongside him. Um, sometimes there were long hours involved. He'd come home late at night, sometimes from traveling home from a gun show. And we would still need to help him out no matter if we were tired or not. Mm. So I watched my dad do the things he needed to do to succeed. But um, he was always working from home, too, when he wasn't traveling. And so we spent more time together as a family. Yes. Um, and I loved watching that. I, I loved being a part of that lifestyle. Mm. Um, I always thought it was so cool that he worked from home because a lot of my friends, you know, they had to go off to work every day and do the eight to five thing or the nine to five. Yes. Um, my mom was able to stay at home with us um, because of the income that he made. Um, so I was just always around that entrepreneurial spirit, which he still has. And um, he dabbles in this. He dabbles in that. Um, yes. He's always his own boss. Wow. And. It's interesting because not only am I an entrepreneur, my sister is as well, and my brother. That's so, amazing. It is. What were it the is. chances of that happening? But I guess it would happen, right? And I, I mean, I remember when I was growing up, I was the youngest in the family, and my dad went to work. You know, he worked for an org. In fact, he worked for the Bank of America, believe it or not. And, um, and that in in Amsterdam, and then we were posted abroad, etc. But I always saw him going to work, doing the you know nine to five or nine till six or whatever. And 
he always used to say things like, you know, when you're working for an organization, he used to come up with a phrase like, don't rock the boat, meaning just do your work, don't say anything. And that was me for years. I ended up becoming like that, you know, working for an organization, working really hard, keeping my mouth shut and just doing what I was told to do. Then eventually it got to me. I couldn't do it anymore. You know? yeah. um, and that's when I woke up and I went, what am I doing in these organizations, making them rich? <laughs> Whereas, right. you know, I could actually do this for myself and have a, you know, have a lifestyle that I'm going to be happy with. So fascinating how parents can influence your future direction for sure. Yeah. And I think it's important to give them the opportunity to grow. Um, when I, I remember all seven was for some reason a big year for me because I remember going to a gun show with my dad and I used to travel with them pretty often. And some of these some of these gun shows were a little bit rough, I have to say. Some of the clientele that are there. But my dad always protected me. And so that grew our relationship because I always felt, oh, you know, he's my big, strong dad and I'm his little yes. girl. So we had a lot of fun. And I think um, now as a parent, I see how um, important it is to get kids away on their own with mom, like one on one. That's when the conversations happen. That's when the growth occurs in that that bonding, because I recently took my daughter um, to visit uh, my, my 95 year old grandmother in Canada. Wow. And I've taken her twice now, actually. Uh, we try to visit every six months now because of her age. Yes. We just we treasure that time with her. Um, but my daughter, Jessie, is seven. Uh, uh, again, the seven. But um, yes. she is just such a delight. And um, we have such fun together. And she never gives me any trouble because it's always, you know, she's delighted to be a part of the adventure. Yes. Um, so anyway, my dad used to actually put a sandwich board on me with the, you know, the big piece of cardboard in the front and the back. Right. And it said... It said, you won't believe this, it said something to the effect of, uh, I will run your errands for you and <gasps> for tips. Yeah. So here is, am I. Now, I'm a tall person, um, so I looked, I looked older probably, but I still looked no more than nine when I was right. seven. Yes. And I'm running around with the sandwich board on in an enclosed area, but still, I, I look back and I'm like, wow, I don't know if that was safe. <laughs> but, but again, this is, the, this is the 80s and 90s. Yes. So, um. Things were a little different then than they are now. But um, so I'm running around and I'm I'm actually running errands for people, because if you think about it, there's a there's thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. And if yeah. that person is there at the gun show by themselves, they they can't leave. They can't mm. do anything. Mm. So I would go and get sandwiches or coffee or whatever it was that they wanted. And they would tip me and usually really nicely. And I quickly learned that the nicer I was to people and the more I smiled and the more I made small talk with them, they'd tip me more. <gasps> and so, I wow. mean, I was doing pretty good as a seven-year-old making some cash. <laughs> it was fun. It was really Aww. fun. And and my dad would pay me because I am his right-hand person. So quickly, I learned that I can make money doing what I'm able to do. And it really empowered me. So mm. that was that was pretty big, too. It's incredible. Um, it's incredible because, first of all, at that age, I mean, it depends how you've grown up as well, I guess. But the fact that you were exposed to a lot of things that your father was doing, that he was taking you to these things, your confidence grew. And then when you had to do that as a job, your confidence, it was like... Um, it's compounding, you know, so it's confidence upon confidence upon confidence. And therefore that just grew inside of you, even at that young age, which is a, which is a wonderful gift that he gave you. Incredible. Yeah. And I think we need those opportunities. Um, mm. I definitely and my kids actually all have done voiceover jobs down to the three year old have all had paying voiceover jobs. So yeah. I am delighted to pass on that um, that experience to them that I had in my own way with my father's business. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, it's important to pour into your kids and give them that opportunity, not just to earn money, but to feel proud of themselves for a job yes. well done and to use whatever skills they have. Um, for me, I've always had a really outgoing personality and my dad knew that. Yes. So he knew that I wouldn't be terribly frightened, although I was. I mean, there's like I said, some of the clientele in there were a little uh, uh, gruff, mm. but 
Um, so I was a little afraid of the people sometimes, but I just did it anyway because yeah. that's what I had to do. Mm. And I wanted to make money. And and also I wanted that approval. I wanted my dad to be proud of me. And he was. Brilliant. We're still very close today. But um, anyway, so fast forward, my parents get divorced. I get I go from being homeschooled into going to a high school of 1,600 people as a sophomore. Mm. And so so everyone has made their friends the previous year, and I've, I'm just coming in the second year, and I've got two more to go after that. So that was a hard time, but it also helped me grow um, just more confident in who am I and what do I stand for and will I stand for something. Mm. Um, I, I always chose good friends, and I again, I, I have to give credit to God for that because I just think that was something that I probably would have chosen differently. But I had good friends. I stayed on the right track. Um, I never made any really stupid decisions or anything like that. And um, life just kind of progressed. I got through high school and um, decided to go to our local college here, which is, again, in St. Joseph, Missouri. Yes. Um, I couldn't afford to go anywhere else because, as many people know, divorce is a financial, uh, it, it hurts financially, too. Mm. So, but I, because of our financial situation, um, I had free lunch at high school and, you know, I had to deal with that. We were, we were not, we were not doing so well financially, but to me, I'd always lived frugally anyway, so it didn't make a whole lot of difference. I had some money saved up, so I got a car, um, and I moved on and it didn't, I, it was fine. I didn't focus on money too much. Mm. Um, but I got to college and I paid for everything myself. No one gave me any money because no one had any. No. Um, at that point, my dad and I were um, estranged because of some different situations. So he wasn't a part of my life for a few years until we got back together later on and, and worked everything out. But so he he couldn't help me. My mom wasn't able to help me. Um, I did get some grants and I had some financial I had some scholarships for um, academics and for financial reasons. So I got through college. I ended up getting a communication degree and an emphasis in public relations. And it was right up my alley. I had no clue what I was going to do with it, though, as many college students do today. That's right. They, they get that degree and they've got no idea what in the world they're to do after that. No. Uh, so, you know, I started dating my um, now husband the last semester of my senior year of college. But before that, I just didn't have time for boys. I was way too involved in academics and leadership opportunities and clubs and extracurricular stuff. And wow. that <laughs> I just didn't have time for it. I was I love being and I think that's a big part of my life, too, is that I have learned how to have platonic relationships with the opposite sex. And I think that is huge. Yeah, um, because it's kept me and my husband. It's kept our marriage stronger and kept my thoughts just more uh, loyal to him. Mm. And more faithful. So for that reason, I think, too, you know, again, I was protected from whatever could have happened. But sure, uh, my grades stayed up because I wasn't dating and focusing on boys. And um, I had so many cool leadership opportunities. I was um, a student ambassador and I would show people around the campus and I would represent the school at different um, PR events and I'm still featured on their brochure that that, that um, <laughs> they got they got a photo shoot out of me for free and they still use that thing. <laughs> it's, oh wow! I, it's so funny because every now and then a, somebody will say, "Is this you?" And I'm like, "Yeah, that, that's me." <laughs> when I was like 19, it's still in use, but it's fine. I'm I'm happy and I love my alma mater. I went to um, Missouri Western State. It was college then, and it's now university, but. Mm. It was about 5,500 people, and it allowed me to be sort of a bigger fish in a smaller pond, which I needed at that time, again, to grow my confidence, to let me know that I had the skills that it would take to do life and to lead. And I was good at stuff. It, it gave me the opportunity to see things that I was good at. I've never been great at sports. I'm tall. I'm 5'10", and I'm, I'm strong and athletic looking, but yet I'm really no good at volleyball or basketball or any of those typical tall girl sports. <laughs> sure. Um, and I played a year of soccer in high school and quickly found out that I was absolutely no good. But it was a good experience <laughs> and humbling as well. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, it's it's strange for us here in, in Europe to hear that, you know, people in the USA are playing soccer because, of course... We, we have to kind of translate these 
in our head because we call it football. And oh, right. Course, Sorry. Football, no, no. It's, I've no, forgotten no my problem. audience. <laughs> no, no problem at all. It's, it's just funny to hear it. And, you know, and I, I guess the fact that you're mentioning it is amusing probably to our listeners. I mean, I wasn't, I never played soccer or football as we call it uh, myself. So I'm not a big you know, follower of the sport in, in, in Europe, but it's it's huge in this, this part of the world. Oh yeah. As is, as is football, obviously in the USA. And which is starting to happen here now actually. Uh it's starting to happen in the UK, London in particular. But <clears throat> so it's interesting and it's also good to hear that, you know, that that colleges are starting to embrace soccer more and more in the USA because I think it will just make it more interesting for the rest of the world as well. So, mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, But you didn't continue with it, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, and I have this degree now, and I also, you know, I was engaged to be married, and I was like, well, I need a job. I can't mm. just sit around doing nothing with myself all day. Right. I'm not going to I mean, I I am a stay at home mom now. And I, I believe that being a domestic support is very important. But at that point, I didn't have any kids to take care of. My husband was at work all day and you can only clean the house so many times before you That's get right. really bored. Yeah. So I'm sitting around twiddling my thumbs trying to find a job because I had gone away for the summer after college to Ukraine um, to um, teach some English camps and things that would help uh, college students there learn English. And it was a really cool experience that I wouldn't trade for the world. Well, that's and a I... pretty, pretty, I mean, going from Missouri to the Ukraine, that's, that's big stuff, right? Oh, yeah. But I mean, I love adventure and I love to travel. And it's just kind of like I want to have that home base when I come back, though. Yeah. Um, but I loved Ukraine and, I, you know, I learned just a smattering of Russian and that was it. Um, mm -hmm. I was in uh, Simferopol uh, and I traveled to Australia in 2001, which was the uh, year after my freshman year of college. So I've gotten to experience what it's like to travel abroad. And I think that is so important to broaden our view of the world and our understanding and acceptance of other cultures. Yes. So it was a lot of fun. Well, uh, well but done. anyway. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm so thankful because now, you know, I can't do it. I knew it was going to be a now or never situation. So I yeah. went. Yeah. But then when I come back, I've had no contacts lined up. But one important thing that played into my current position is when I was it was either my junior or senior year of college. I thought for just a minute that I wanted to be um, an ad executive and sell ad spots on like ca to cable companies. Right. Well. And I thought, you know, that would be such a fun job. Well, it, it was not my thing. I mm. hate sales. I didn't realize how much I hated sales. Mm. Um, so I gave it a try and I worked at a cable company. I would sell um, these little itty bitty spots um, for I, it's hard to explain. But anyway, mm. I was no good at it. I was no good at it. But while I was there, I made um, I made friends with everybody because it was a small company. And there, the producer heard my voice and he's like, hey, you know, we we need a commercial for you know, the cable, the cable company, would you mind reading this spot? Hmm. So I'm like, yeah, okay. I didn't know what voiceover was. I had no clue what it was. So I would go into this little closet that had been converted to a recording studio and I would read it. I would take this piece of paper that he gave me five minutes ago, take a quick look at it, get in the booth, read it three times. And he was so happy. And hmm. that was it. I didn't stumble over my words. I knew where the, I just somehow knew instinctively where the emphasis should be and whether your voice should go up or down. And it just came to me. And he was so pleased. And I got That's paid an ridiculous. extra. ridiculous. Yeah. And I got paid extra <laughs> money for that. And boy, did I need it because I was selling plasma to get through college. OK, I yeah. have the scar to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> so I needed all the gas money I could get. Yes. Wow. So I was like, oh, this is great. Well, you know, he didn't need me that often. And I didn't know what the name of it was. I mm -hmm. just knew I liked it. Yeah. Well. You know, and that kind of was in the back of my mind, but no, nothing ever happened with it because I was only, I was at, I, I knew this one guy that needed voiceover stuff. Yes. So after college, I didn't know you could make a career out of such a thing. So I just kind of went into the tr traditional things and I was checking out, you know, when monster.com was cool, I was checking out jobs there. 
yes. and found one for a claims adjuster. And um, so I took it because the pay was, was good and the benefits were good. So I was an auto claims adjuster for wow. five years. Wow. Uh, and I know I'm not a I'm not a car expert. I, I was never one of those people that hung out with my dad in the garage and took apart cars. Nothing like that. No. I didn't know what I was doing. So I got trained from the ground up. But that also helped me realize that whatever you want to learn, you can learn. Sure. Um, you've got to put your mind to it. But I, I had high marks in both, you know, figuring out uh, writing physical damage um, estimates for cars. I had high marks in customer service because whatever I want to do, I can do if I put my mind to it. Mm. I had no previous experience. So, um, so and that's it also, an interesting one. So if you didn't have any previous ex experience in that at all, how did you manage to get that job? They just wanted a degree. It could be any degree wow. or five years experience was the requirement that I recall. Right. Interesting. OK. Yeah. So I had a piece of paper, so they let me in and... Um, it was a four week training process, so it was it was not easy. It might have been even long. I mean, really, it was longer than that. But, but four weeks isn't even that long, to be honest. Not really. No. Um, they sent me to, they sent me on location to learn about cars where we actually had a, had physical cars and did estimates. And then another two weeks was, I think, learning about, you know, the policy and things like that. And we have to, un you know, we'd have to take statements. We'd have to be able to, even if we knew someone was lying, we can't say that. Mm -hmm. um, very mm -hmm. tricky with all of this. But we can say things like, well, you know, the side of your car is a safety yellow and they don't paint cars that color. So I think you ran into a pole, you know, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh -huh. that was really my first actual job that wasn't waitressing or selling cookies door to door or babysitting. But as far as the babysitting, I never realized how important it was that I did babysit so much because um, I would read I would read out loud to children since the since the day I could read. Right. I was reading out loud. Okay. And that really played into my career in voiceover because when you read silently, you're not you're not getting those skills. No. It's excellent for vocabulary and literacy, but you're not enunciating. You're not inflecting. You're not, um, you know, figuring out your breath control and all that. Mm. But I love reading out loud to kids. And so I would do the voices and I would, you know, I would make it exciting if it was a mysterious part of the story, yes. that sort of thing. Yes. Um, so I never realized I was actually training to be a voice actor at that point. Um, and I still love reading to my kids. And unfortunately, it's like if dad's in the room and mom's in the room, they pick me every time. It's, it's terrible. I feel terrible for him because he really <laughs> wants to read to them. <laughs> but they want me to do it. <laughs> because it sounds so real when you do it. <laughs> yeah, it does. They I mean, are I'm, transported. I'm good at it. Yeah, they are transported into the story completely because of the way that you embellish it when you're telling the story. That's incredible. I find this incredible how accidental this is all sounding, Tracy. <laughs> Michael, it really is. And that's, I feel like a bit of a fraud coming on here in some points because some people just really have their lives mapped out and they know what they're going to do. Mm. I was never that way. I was never that way. And the only, I actually quit my job as an auto claims adjuster I did. I disliked the job for a long time. I really did not enjoy it. Um, sure. uh, you know, I remember just feeling the stress and like, what is the point of this other than a paycheck? Yeah. And I would sometimes there would be long hours that I wasn't getting paid for. Um, mm -hmm. In the summertime, people tend to have more accidents because they let their hair down. They play their music louder. They pay no attention. This was even before people were texting and driving and stuff like that because it wasn't yeah. as prevalent. Um, but, and you know, people hit deer, whatever. So I'd be working these long hours and I wasn't getting paid for it. And I was so just mad at myself that I was such a perfectionist that I couldn't just do a, do a okay job and move on. Mm -hmm. I had to do my best. And so that minute I was there longer and I was getting home at like nine o'clock at night and just exhausted. And I was getting paid no extra money for these 
more hours. Yeah. So when I had my son, I'd been working there for five hours, five years. And when I had my first child, I quit my job to stay home with him because I the plan was I was going to go back to work. But then he suckered me in with that smile and those coos <laughs> and those chubby little hands. And I was hooked. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I gave him my resignation. And that was that. Yeah. Oh, fabulous. fabulous. So then I was a stay at home mom, really, for about five years before I even discovered, you know, the voiceover industry. I was still schlepping it in to the studio here and there um, yeah. to read these spots. And pretty soon the money just wasn't worth it. It was it was inconvenient to have to find child care. They wouldn't mm. mind if I'd take the kids in with me because they knew I'd be in the booth for about five minutes tops. Yeah. But after a while, it still wasn't worth it. When I had my third child and I was I had her in a baby carrier and I was bringing crayons for everybody to sit there by the producer while he was recording. It was just stupid. <laughs> and I said, I can't do this anymore. I, I'm not I'm not going to do it, even though yeah. I love this. I said, it just isn't worth it for me anymore. He says, did you know that people do voiceover out of their house? No, I didn't know that. Jason wow. <laughs> was his name. So as soon as I heard that, I started researching what this is all about. And I, my mind was just blown. I was like, oh, I, I could have, oh my gosh, I could have a home studio. I could have, um, I could have a work from home life and be with my kids and do what I love. I knew I already loved the work. So the more I researched it, the more I knew this is my calling right here. This mm. is my jam. Mm. And so this was in January of 2004 when that happened. Right. No, it wasn't. 2014. Excuse yeah, me. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I really, I'm, I've only been doing this about five years, but my business has grown exponentially. Um, I do a ton of work with Pandora, which I don't think you guys have that. It's streaming radio. And um, I do a lot of work with iHeartRadio. Um, I have tons of different, I mean, I've got, crazy brands that I've worked for. I mean, Visa, eBay, Microsoft, Amazon, McDonald's, just to name a few. Um, mm. Anything is possible. There's a there's a promo playing right now for a show on Bravo that's got my voice on it. It's just really cool to be part of this. Um, I never want to get a big head by any means because I know where I came from. And yeah. I know that I'm nothing, you know, I'm special, but we're all special um, mm. in our own way. Mm. So. It keeps me humble to know my story and where I've come from. Um, and just, you know, I'm, I'm a mom from Missouri with four kids, but yet I have this, like, it's almost like an alter ego, you know? <laughs> it's pretty cool. But you know something? The fact that you don't hide behind anything, there's, there's no facade to say, you know, I've got a super duper million dollar recording studio to do this for you. The fact that you do say kind of authentically and honestly and openly, and I think this is part of it. This is part of it. You know, I'm a mum with four kids under 10 years old working from home in my studio. And the fact that your voice sounds great and the quality is amazing, it doesn't really matter, does it, where it's done at the end of the day? I don't think it does. And there are some vo there are some voice talent who when they get pregnant or they have a baby, they're afraid to share that. They're afraid mm. to tell their clients that they now have a child. And and to me, I just think that's sad that you can't share something so important to you because you're afraid that you won't get that job because they think you, all they're going to hear is pitter patter and screaming and people throwing crayons. But mm. that is not that is not reality. I mean, I've trained my children that if mommy's recording, you got to be really quiet and you stay on this half of the house because the yeah. other half it will, you know, little steps above above me. Mm. And they know that. And mm. I also limit electronics. So, you know, even right now, they're upstairs watching a movie on Netflix because they never get to do it. So I only let them do electronics when I am recording. Yeah. And and so they embrace that. And and them being I have a three year old and a five year old here at my home right now. You can't hear them. Because no. I've trained my children and the thing that is, you are respectful. Would, yeah. Why would anybody even question it even, you know, because the fact is that everybody knows what family life is like. Everybody knows, you know, 
everybody appreciates it. So therefore, I don't know what the problem is. I don't know why people are concerned about it. You know, if the yeah. if the product and the turnaround and the quality and the price isn't good enough, then fine. You know, that's a totally different situation. But I think it's an important point because everybody, be well, not everybody, a lot of people believe that to get into business on your own, you need to go and have premises. And they believe that you've got to spend a lot of money on premises, make it look really, really good before you can take be taken seriously. And this just is a is fiction. It's just not true. You know, some companies, yeah, you need premises. So if you're going to be a lawyer, you probably do need premises because people are coming, you know, and they need to have meetings with you. But it's different jobs um, don't require it, you know, in this day sure. and age. But I also on that on the other side of the coin, um, I believe branding is very, very important. If if you take a look at my website, it looks very professional. I yes. believe that I need to put my best face forward and also my best demo quality, um, the functionality of the website. Everything has been very thoughtfully crafted when it comes mm -hmm. to my brand, who I am. But for me, I never want to put on a facade because it actually bodes well for me that I'm extremely honest and authentic about who I am because I get hired so much for an authentic sound. I have a, a real person, real mom sound, and I get so many commercials that that's what they want. They want friendly. They want real. Always I hear, I don't want to hear announcer. I don't want to hear uh, salesy. I mm. want to hear real person. And that is me. And that's why I do well because yeah. I'm not afraid to embrace who I am and the fact that I am a mom of four little kids. And yes, I understand what the frazzled mom voice sounds like. <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> it makes me good at what I do. And yeah, I, but I can also sound super professional. And I do um, I do a little bit of I have a surgical com like a company that does surgical supplies. I have I did a, an e-learning thing about dental anatomy, which was interesting. I, I don't know any dental terms, but I learned. Mm. Um, again, you got to be quick on your feet and be willing to learn anything because you never know what's coming. I just got a, a video package deal where I'll be talking about a company that sells explosives. You don't know what you're going to get or what people mm. want to hire you for. So you have to be open to whatever. Yeah, sure. And what, what's been so interesting, and this is what we often don't realize, that Sometimes it's the accidental training we get through life that develops our skills for the perfect job. And this is what happened to you, where there were some accidental things on the journey that occurred to allow you to get some development and training <laughs> for, right. for something that you didn't realize you were going to be doing full time or part time or whatever. And that, I think it's a beautiful story to hear that. And if if I think back at where were those points for me, I can probably identify them as well, you know, along the journey to say, oh, we all get this accidental training to do something for ourselves if we're just open to it and awake to it. And sometimes you need That's a Jason it. to tell you, mm -hmm. you know, you can get paid for this. <laughs> right. Oh, wow. Because you can have a desire. You can have something that you enjoy doing. But if you cannot monetize it, you can't make a career out of it. Because mm. that's the thing. You ha you can have many loves and many passions. Um, but, you know, I, I can't if I can't monetize it and if I can't bring in an income, then that's not going to benefit my family. Although, you know, I'm very strongly into uh, volunteering and giving back. Um, mm. But what I'm saying is that if somebody loves to knit or if they love to bake um, that's great. That can be a stress relieving activity. But if you're looking to make a career out of it, that's hard. That's hard to do unless, you, sure. you know, you open up a commercial bakery or you have a, a huge Etsy shop. But I don't know how you're going to knit enough stuff to make enough money. I don't know how people yeah. do that. Yeah. But that's all. I'm, yeah, I agree with you that um, it's good to be open to whatever opportunity may may come to you. Mm. And the, and the, the beautiful thing for you was you enjoyed doing it. Right. Oh so, my gosh, I love it. So I'm a little so you, obsessed with checking my email. I won't lie. Sure. <laughs> and and so let's 
because I'm going to pick up now on something else which you mentioned very early on in conversation where you said that you hated sales. You didn't enjoy the sales part of what you were doing. Mm. And whereas roll forward to today, and in fact, you're not just a voice actor doing your work, but you are also training other colleagues how they can get how can how they can be better at selling their services using LinkedIn. Right. And that is also accidental, Michael. I never set out to do any such thing. Right. Um, and me even getting on LinkedIn was an accident. I mean, I just feel like there are so many things in life. That's why you have to be open to see what is this and, and how can it benefit me? But um, when I was first getting started as a voice artist or a voiceover or whatever, you know, there's there's about 10,000 names for us. <laughs> But um, <laughs> call us what you will. Just call us. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, what was I going to say? Uh, OK, so here I am with these new skills and a shiny new demo. And what in the world am I going to do with it besides slap it up on a website? So, you know, I started to try. I tried cold calling. I tried um, cold emailing. And, and I do think those things work. Absolutely. But the thing that really seemed to hit home for me was to contact people on LinkedIn. And I didn't even get on there until sometime in 2014, I believe it was. Um, and then to that, and I just kind of did what a lot of people do, which was slap your profile up there. Don't think a whole lot about it. Put a, put a nice picture and, and leave it at that. And if someone wants to connect with you, you click OK. And that's about that. Mm. Well, um, you can't get any work doing that. And as soon as I thought, and one one day it just occurred to me, someone wrote me a direct message and I was like, oh, we can do direct messages. Okay. So I started um, direct messaging people that I was already connected with and just thinking, okay, I'll reach out and I'll just let them know I'm here. I don't like sales. So what I would do is just put myself out there and say, um, hey, you know, it's nice to meet you. And this is what I do, and I would love to help you if, if that's something that you need, and I'm here anytime, whatever. And I put my uh, website and email address and just made it super casual because mm. the more people hammer at me, the less I want to buy from them, right? Sure, sure. We are, we are in a political season. Um, we have voting happening tomorrow, and all of us are so happy that all the political ads are going to be over, yeah. um, which that's not, you know, it's... Coming from me, that's biting the hand that feeds me because I actually do some political ads too. But we're all just getting a little tired of it. And they're so sure. hard hitting. They're so hard hitting. Political ads are. And attack ads are even worse. But anyway, um, we we as, as a culture typically like to be soft sold something. And um, y y there's so many. The If you look at the history of how advertising has worked, it used to be buy this because I said to. And now it's. Let me just tell you about it. And if you want it, cool. And mm -hmm. that's the way advertising is gone. Right. Mm -hmm. You you know this. Yes, and, I do. <laughs> um, and so anyway, I took that approach when it came to connecting with people and, and communicating with people on the Internet. So pretty soon I started to notice it was working. I'd have people start asking me if I could do voiceover jobs via LinkedIn. And it was usually as a direct result of me contacting them. And then I realized I can search for people. I can use different um, keywords and, um, you know, location tags and things like that to where I can target who I'm trying to reach and why. Yes. And it just started to make more and more and more sense. So I presented this information. I went to my first voiceover conference in 2016. So I'd only been in the industry two years. Mm. And talk about feeling like you don't belong. Right. Um, we all have that imposter syndrome at some point in our career. Of course, of course. Sure. And so I walk into this conference and I don't know anybody. And I've, I recognize them all, like so many people from the internet because I would be involved in this Facebook group or whatever. And so I, I, I was just kind of freaking out a little inside. But at this particular conference, they allow anyone attending the conference to lead a session if they get enough votes. Mm. And it's it's called it's called FAFCON. They don't do it anymore, but it's uh, we're having our last year next year and they don't they're not opening it up to new people. But anyway, it's just for voiceover talent. And it's also they go through a vetting process of whether they're good enough to go, basically, or further enough in their career or have enough potential. And so I was allowed into the conference and 
when I show up and they tell me that I could potentially teach a session if I what you do is you take your you like write down your topic on an index card and you stick it to the wall and everyone has a certain number of stickers that they can vote and um, they put it on the little index card if they are interested in that topic. And I thought, OK, the heck with it. I'm going to go for it and I'll just put my card on the wall and probably no one's going to vote for it. So then I won't have to do the session. Yes. And, and my topic was how to find clients and um, build your it was something to do with finding clients using using uh, LinkedIn. Yes. So I put the card up there and walked away and thought no one's going to vote for that. So I come back at the end and it is covered with stickers. Oh, my God. And I thought, oh, no. Now I'm going to have to put together a session on the fly because I'm here and I never expected to do the session. So I have not prepared. Wow. It was a moment of panic. <laughs> and, you know, again, my mantra, be open to whatever opportunity presents itself. And I was like, OK, this is an opportunity. Chill out. And I'm not kidding you. I couldn't even eat that day. The day I was supposed to give my presentation, it was going to be at like one o'clock or something. And everyone else was having this delicious salad bar for lunch. Mm. I couldn't eat a thing. Oh, so I, my God. I gulped down my protein drink that I have thankfully brought with me. And off I go to this session and I walk in the room to set everything up. There's already people sitting there and it ended up being full of like 60 people and all these industry pros that I look up to and I admire and they're all there to hear me talk. And I mean, oh, my. Oh, God. my gosh. That's I know. I was I was petrified. I was absolutely petrified. But I'm like, OK, well, you've made your bed. You better get up there and say That's something. Right. <laughs> so I had had time to put together a presentation. I had brought my computer. So I hook it all up and I just away we go. And I'm just going to pretend that I am not extremely frightened out of my mind. Mm. And I get up there and give I gave a great presentation. My personality is one that just I'm going to feed off the room. Um, and people were raising their hands, asking questions, writing notes, like copious notes. They're just writing down like everything I said. And and I had one guy in there who's sort of a mentor to me. I think he's he's probably in his 60s or something. And he is. He is so like dry humor and kind of the epitome of your grumpy old man. But he is so soft hearted and he's he's from the Kansas City area like I am. So he's been a mentor for me and he heckled me just a little bit. And I think yeah. that took the edge off. Like I chilled out a little bit after that. Right. Because um, I, I don't I love to joke around and I love to have fun. And it, it made me realize that this is fun. I get to share something I know with all of these people who know way more and have so much more experience than I do. Mm. Um, after that session, I had somebody come up to me and ask me to be in their uh, sort of account accountability group where they share tips with each other. I had someone else saying they wanted to be my accountability partner. I had someone <laughs> else saying she would exchange an hour of her time for an hour of my time. And she is a branding expert. And I was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so at that point, I knew I was on to something that people hadn't heard before. And it was mm. thrilling. It was thrilling to be able to give something back to my industry and, and the people that had helped me along the way. And I was learning from them in these Facebook groups and stuff like that. Yeah. So I was I was so thrilled to be able to give back something. But then I started getting all of these emails, emails, emails. Oh, will you look at my LinkedIn profile? Will you do this? Will you do that? Right. And it, oh, my gosh. I spent probably... Uh, I don't even know how many hours, Michael, looking at people's and I never charged a penny for it no. because they were my friends, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I After understand. a while, though, you know how it goes that you only have so many hours in the day and I've got little That's children. Right. That's my, right. Oh, gosh. I had a baby. My last baby was born in 2015. So at this point, she was like a year and a half. I didn't have any time for this. No. So. The more that I thought about it, the more I realized you have got to create something external where it doesn't take you to teach people. So mm. I created an e-course and it didn't happen overnight. And boy, did I try to procrastinate and put it off. Yeah. And I put it off and put it off and put it off for months. But the emails kept coming. The requests kept coming. People were always swamping me with questions and I wanted to help them, but I just didn't have any time. So finally, mm. I buckled down over... A, a period of probably to, uh, just about a week. And I I wrote and recorded and, you know, did all did all these um, 
different PowerPoints and stuff and recorded my screen. And so what I have is a mix of on camera, like little introductions from me, a raw, raw to kind of warm you up and tell you what it is. So those are like, you know, one and a half to two minutes most of the time. Mm -hmm. And then I have um, a lot of some, I do some screen sharing where I demonstrate different things on LinkedIn. And then I did um, some PowerPoint presentations and recorded my screen while I'm talking about it. So it's a combination of all of those things and I have um, several different downloadable PDFs and, and things like that that people can take and use on their own. So it became an immediate success. I launched it last December. So I actually need to go in and probably update a few things because, as you know, LinkedIn is always changing. Uh, not oh. as much now, but yeah, there's little things that are changing in the past year. Yeah, you're right. It's a but, lot of dimensions and where they place the profile pictures, things like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. But, you know, the, at the end of the day, it's not so much about the actual appearance of stuff or how things work. I think it's what you're more than likely are explaining. What is the process that you use? You know, how do you communicate? What do you say? Um, you know, what's the language that you use? How do you come across, like you were saying right at the beginning, you know, softly, softly approach rather than a kind of hard sell um, kind of situation? So I, th I think it's, it's perfect that you're doing this. Absolutely perfect. And, you know, we communicated on LinkedIn. In fact, you, you might not remember, but we, we connected in 2014, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And so four years ago, so it's taken me four years to finally hire you. Right. <laughs> and, you know, that's what I tell people, too. I'm like, sometimes you just don't need somebody right away. But no. once once I joined your contacts, all you have to do is search, I don't know, voice actor, whatever you do. That's to right. Look back yeah. and you yeah. found me again. That's right. Yeah. and uh, And because we had a lot of exchanges and you'd shared some of your prices with me and there was a lot of information that I already had about you and I could refresh my memory what you sounded like and try and imagine you you know reading the script with the video and the content and the target audience it was easy then you know I didn't if you were available and still doing it then great and you were and there we go so yeah it makes it super easy. So, yeah. Probably good I, you didn't hire me back then. My sound quality wasn't good. And I've grown a lot since then. So I'm glad oh, you didn't yeah. hire me then, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, there probably wasn't a need then. But, you know, also in those days, I, I think I was doing quite a bit of work in the USA at the time. And there were different projects being thrown at me. And I needed to make sure you know, from my point of view, and this, you will have this with other people that are doing video production and stuff. They, they need to make sure they have a catalog of voices or at least somebody they know they can get to quickly because mm -hmm. it's always, there's always time constraints. And the one thing I've learned about voiceovers in the world, they are so good. The ones I've worked with, maybe I've just been lucky, and these are the people in the UK and the USA. And I've, you know, I've kind of developed my favorites. Their turnaround time and communication has always been so excellent, so superb. And the same with you. And it's, it's just been so a delight to work with you guys because I know I can rely on you. And, and that's we as video producers need to be able to do that, you know, at a moment's notice going, OK, the script is signed off. We need the voiceover doing now. So mm -hmm. uh, and there isn't like a three week lead time or whatever before it can get done. So, um, yeah, we we right. need to have those people in our contact lists. Yeah, definitely. And LinkedIn is, the, LinkedIn is the best way to be able to do that. So your strategy of helping your colleagues you know, and friends to to learn LinkedIn and how to get into people's contact lists is even even though the you know they don't need to go and go they don't need to go and say to them, hey, do you want to hire me? You know, because you don't even need to do that because mm -hmm. all you need to do is get into that contact list. 
because then they know I know I've got voiceovers in my contact list. Let me just quickly do a search. And that's what I did. Right. You know? And I think it's important to be memorable too. Um, to and that's where the the messaging comes in. But yeah, just really softly, not not hard, not in your face, just exactly what you said. I and mm. I know that usually we are the very very end of the of the line. We're the last bit of the project, other than editing it in and timing it correctly. But uh, am I right in saying that? Is that typically how it works, Michael? The voiceover yeah, is totally. the very last bit. Yeah, totally. So yeah, when I'm when I'm doing my animations, yeah, I'll I'll get everything ready. I'll create all the scenes, string them all together, and then I need to do the timing with the voiceover. That's my last job that I do. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So so yeah. so at that point, you're ready to get that project out the door. Your client is is probably starting to bear down on you in in some yes. ways. Like, well, they're really ready to see that video, even if yes. they aren't going to use it right away. They can't wait to see it. That's and right. Yeah. So we have to have those quick turnarounds, and we we have to get it right the first time. You know, there can't mm. be mistakes. If if I say a, a wrong word, and and I have to go back and correct that, that is more time out of the process. Mm. And 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 that delays it. We can't have that. So you've got to be accurate and and those quick turnaround times and excellent quality, not a not a single um, extraneous noise. We can't mm. have that because you've no. got to have it perfect the first time. There are always those revisions. A lot of times the client will come back with a revision, but at least I know that's not on me. And I always give the absolute one hundred percent best I can that first time because I know what a time constraint it is. And I yeah. always think of you as the video producer. We're on the same team. Our goal is to make this beautiful project to hand over to the client that they're just going to flip and do backflips over and love. Yes. And I want to be part of that. I love being part of the process and, and looking and I look at you as a team member. And that's mm. the way I teach people about LinkedIn. Like when you're approaching people, you're wanting to be part of the team. You don't have to sell yourself so hard because you need me and I need you. And that's how LinkedIn is so beautiful. That brings us together. That That's a really, and I've never heard anybody say it in that way before, that, you know, being a team member, being on the same team. And that's a great way of looking at it. And actually, it's a great way for any small business looking at clients, you know, being on the same team as them. And they need you and you need them. So, I love that as a concept, as an idea to to look at it in that way rather than the, you know, often people just look at it as a transactional relationship rather than, you know, being part of the team. Yeah. Beautiful. And I also think, yeah, I mean, it's about building relationships because I want to work with you in the future. All of my clients, I want them to come back to me and know yeah. that they can rely on me because I'm afraid of what they might find out there. There's a lot of, you know, people that say they're a voice talent that have a terrible microphone, an echoey room, no inflection, but they can they can produce a great demo with a professional demo producer and then their work is just terrible. I don't want you to have to sift through all of those people. I want to make sure that you've got good people. And that's why I always tell my clients too. I'm like, hey, if I'm not the right person for if I'm not the right voice type for you. I will not take it personally in any way if you ask me for a male or someone with a different accent or someone with a different, like you need a higher voice or whatever. I would mm. love to send good people your way so you can have them as part of your team because I can't, I can't be the voice of all your videos. I know that's boring. No one mm. wants that. You need variety. Sure, sure. Wow. So, so um, do you have... Then, in in terms of where you are now with your business and your voiceover, what what for you? If you had a magic wand and you said, right, these are the kind of clients that I'm looking for to, you know, do you have a preference at all, or are you pretty much happy to work with anyone? Well, I mean, I have certain areas that I love more than others. I enjoy e-learning because um, I always learn something. But it does take longer and the pay is less because it's a longer project and it takes yeah. me more time. So yeah. I do love e-learning, but on in the other side of the coin, I, I need to choose projects, if possible, that are shorter and then I can get paid higher quantities for. So my favorite things to do are commercials 
because there's also a lot of variety there and I get to use a lot of energy. A lot of times when I do e-learning, they prefer that I have to talk slower. I have to yeah. talk in in more of a monotone because I just you don't want to hear an hour of someone being so excited. It just gets annoying. I yes. understand that. I do. <laughs> But because of that, I love commercials because they love that excitement and they want my personality. Whereas some of these projects, I have to like push it down and I hate to do that. So it all has its beauty. But if I could absolutely say these are my fun things, I would I would pick commercials. And I also love like we did an animated video together and that was fun, too. It's short. um, It's it's fun. It tells a story. It's yeah. less communicating of information and more of a storytelling perspective. Mm. And even in a commercial, you tell a story, but you only have 30 seconds or 60 That's seconds right. or 15 yeah. or 10. Yeah. Sometimes five. So <laughs> every word and every inflection counts. And yeah. so it's it's a little bit more pressure, but I don't mind that because I just I love the versatility of it and and I have a range where I can I can get really high and really excited or I can, you know, I can bring it down here and sell you some luxury cars, you know. So I love that variety. And it, it is so mm. fun for me to see, oh, what's coming next for what commercial am I going to get next? What am I mm. selling today? But selling but not selling. Right. I mean, again, the soft sell approach most of the time, unless it's a furniture store or, a you know, a lot of times the car lots and, you know, they're moving that. They're moving that merchandise out. So they got a lot of copy in a little amount of time. It's energy, energy. How many words can I fit into 30 seconds? I know. I know. And I, I think and th- this will be a, a completely different conversation for another podcast altogether. But I because I, I, I do, you know, kind of working in industry and creating, helping people create stories. Um, I I do shy away from you know, people do ask me to create like an advert and I have a real job convincing them that actually a story would be better than an advert. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I do get it. You know, if if people have like multi-million dollar budgets to do advertising, then yeah, take that hammer and hit that rock so many times that a dent will be in your brain eventually. And it will stay there and you will walk into a store and buy a product and you won't know why you bought it. But because you've seen the adverts about 60 times, it's gone into your brain. Um, but in the kind of general kind of business market, I, I coach people to, you know, share stories. And I think using voiceovers to articulate that story is so much more interesting and exciting because that voice has to pull in the listener and the viewer as well. So it's right. n- it isn't just the pictures, it's a combination. So it's the visual, auditory and kinesthetic bit, you know, so this NLP is involved where people exactly. are seeing the pictures, great, they get excited by that, but they're also, and that's why the second one is auditory, you know, what are they hearing? Because that will determine their feeling about it the most, the most. And, and the feeling is what you want to leave them with. The voice plays such a massive part in that for me, for me, because I try and get people to look at all of their communication as a opportunity to share a bit of the story. And that's, of course, why I do this podcast, to help people share their story, uh, because stories are interesting, you know. You know how excited your children are with your stories. <laughs> <laughs> It, I think the human brain can't resist a good story, but that's it has it. to be a good one. That's it. Yeah, that's the that's the hardest bit. It's creating the good one. Um, um, well, you do a um, fine um, job, Michael. Oh, bless you. Most companies still are pushing into, yeah, but I want to get my information out about my product. I said, all you need is for them to pick up the phone. That's your first thing you want to get to, you know, or send you a message on LinkedIn. That's the and the only way you can get them to do that is to share a story. You don't have to tell them everything. But people think, oh, well, I've got to tell them everything in this one clip, you know. And I said, well, if you've told them everything, there's no opportunity to create anything else. after That's exactly it. 
And I and I do tell people that with LinkedIn, like, don't tell them everything and don't sit there and list your prices and tell them all the equipment in your studio. They don't want to hear that. Life is about problem solution, problem solution. And it's how can we help meet your needs and solve your problems? That's what you do as a video producer. That's what I do as a voice talent. I mean, Mm -hmm. we're just meeting needs and solving problems. And that's what life is all about is working together to do that. I love it. I love it. So, Tracy, how can people get in touch with you? Could you share your kind of site, website and social channels where they can find you? Absolutely. My main hub, my main website is tracylindley.com. And Tracy is T-R-A-C-Y and Lindley is L-I-N-D-L-E-Y and it's .com. But I've bought different domains because people spell my name wrong first and last all the time. So even if you misspell it, you'll probably get redirected to me, hopefully. Or oh, I'm also, that's good. of course, I'm on LinkedIn and yeah. um, I am also, and and of course, my name. And then I'm on Twitter and I'm Tracy Lindley VO. I'm on Instagram also as Tracy Lindley VO. And I'm on Facebook. I have Tracy Lindley voiceovers business page, but I don't really think anybody uses those too much anymore. It's just there. Yeah. If, if people need to search there, they can find you there as well. Well, I'll I'll include those in the show notes as well anyway, so they'll be able to read up and click through on those. And it's it's been so fantastic chatting with you, listening about your story and all the amazing stuff you're doing today. But what was so interesting for me is is witnessing or hearing about your kind of axel, accidental journey into this job, which you just totally love. And I'm so pleased for you that you found it. Well done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. It's, you know, they always say, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And I totally believe that. I also believe you can you can have it all. I have a thriving career, a, a, a wonderful marriage where my husband and I actually have fun most of the time. Our kids drive us nuts a little bit, but yeah. um, that's just all part of it. You know, we have a healthy home life. We're all healthy and happy. We try to stay fit. We give back to our community. Um, he does a job he loves. I do a job I love from home, hanging out with the kids. Your dream life is possible. And I just think, you know, it's only limited by, by what you believe you can accomplish. I love that. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll talk again about any future projects. You know, I'm here for you anytime. (laughs) You're part of the team now. (laughs) Yeah. That's where I like to be. (laughs) Okay, Tracy, take care. Thank you. You too, Michael. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.